Chapter 25 Mud Cat to the Rescue Hours seemed to elapse as the girls lay in the smoke-filled loft, and then, when Hope had deserted them, they heard men's voices. Get the hose running, boys. Someone bring a ladder. Mudcat says he saw someone upstairs. Penny and Louise thrilled to the words. Rescue was at hand. A moment later, the trap door shot up, and Mudcat Joe thrust his head and shoulders through the square opening. Well, I'll be doggoned, he had he said, and calling loudly for help from below, rushed to Penny and began working on her bones. She was soon free, and they both turned to aid Louise. Oh, I hope they can save the laundry, Penny gasped. There's so much evidence here against Sin Lee, it shouldn't be destroyed. Mudcat Joe hustled the two girls down the ladder into the arms of the waiting firefighters. They were led outside where the cool night air came as a welcome relief to their lungs. Fire was shooting from the lower windows, but it did not appear to have a big start, and there was no wind. The town bell clanged continuously, summoning the volunteer firefighters to the scene. Miss Faraday and Laura came running from the old mansion, but before Penny could speak to them, she saw an automobile draw up at the curb. Why, there's Dad! she exclaimed to Louise, and ran across the street. Penny, he cried, this building must be saved. I've learned that Sing Lee is just one behind everything. Valuable evidence we found in that laundry. You're telling me, laughed Penny. Having no suspicion that his daughter had just escaped death, Mr. Parker and his companion, Gregory Kane, jumped from the car and ran to help the firefighters. However, their services were really not required, and in a few minutes they came back satisfied that the blaze was under control. Dad, how did you learn about Sing Lee? Penny asked. From Jerry, replied her father. Greg and I just came from the hospital. Is he better? Yes, rational again. He told us what happened. It's a frantic story and fascinating, and it may not be true in every particular, although Jerry seemed to realize what he was saying. After tonight, I believe anything, declared Penny. Jerry learned everything while he was being held as a prisoner. Sing Lee induced Gus Comstock to go in with him on a scheme to steal Miss Faraday's paintings. His wife, however, had nothing to do with the plot, although she realized what was afoot when cheap paintings were substituted for the originals. It was a crude scheme. From Gus Comstock's standpoint, yes. But he was a weak character, and he felt confident Mrs. Faraday would never return to discover the deception. Of course, unwittingly, Comstock played into Sing Lee's hands. By threatening him with exposure, Gus could be induced to agree to anything. Then, he had a part in those mysterious disappearances? No active part, Jerry says, but he had a good idea of what had occurred. You see, Sing Lee placed four portraits in the room seven against the wall. I could tell you something about those pictures, Penny said, but her father did not notice the interruption. This is the part I can't believe, Mr. Parker went on. I fear Jerry is still a bit mixed up. Anyway, he claims that after he retired to room 7 that night of the party, all was quiet for nearly two hours. He was just dozing when a noise drew his attention towards the painting on the east wall. At the same time, he became conscious of an overpowering perfume in the room. Then, the eyes of those paintings, four pairs of them, focused upon him. The way Jerry described it, it made the chills run down his spine. Then what happened, Dad? Jerry believed that the incense produced an overpowering sense of fear in the victims. In any case, the sight of those eyes staring at him was terrifying enough. He snapped a photograph and moved to the door. It was locked, probably from some trick mechanism. Jerry declares definitely that he had not locked it himself. By this time, he was pretty well worked up. He tried to shout, but couldn't utter a word. The incense kept pouring into the room, 
but those burning eyes from the portraits all focused on him. Then a panel in the south wall slid open. Jerry said he didn't seem to have control of his own body. His one thought was to escape from the room. In terror, he fled through the opening. And dropped straight into the river, said Penny. Yes, the cold plunge brought him to his senses. But before he could start to swim, a motorboat came alongside and he was hauled in by a Chinese man. Jerry was robbed of his watch and ring and taken downstream to a houseboat. A houseboat, exclaimed Penny. Then Louise and I really found the hideout and didn't realize it. Jerry was imprisoned along with two other men, Harmon and Merriman. He learned their stories. Merriman had been robbed of his jewels while Harmon was being kept there to prevent him from disclosing his knowledge. That was why Sing Lee captured Jerry too. Having learned that he was a reporter, he feared exposure. Why didn't Sing Lee simply take his loot and disappear? His Tongmen, there are some eight or ten involved in the plot, were greedy for more money. They brought pressure on Sing Lee to keep up the little game a week longer. How did Jerry escape? He managed to get away when one of his captors brought food. Merriman and Harmon helped him to overpower the man, and Jerry jumped overboard, but not before he had been struck on the head. You know the rest of the story. He'd never have reached land if Mudcat Joe's boat hadn't been handy to pick him up. Before Mr. Parker could say more, Laura Blair hurried up. Oh, Penny, she said. You had such a narrow escape from death. Mr. Parker turned to stare at his daughter, bewildered by the remark. Oh, Louise, I had a little adventure with Sing Lee, Penny laughed. She related the story and told of their findings in the basement of the laundry and in the temple. The machinery behind the altar must have served to move the wall panel, she declared. Oh, Sing Lee was a very wicked and very clever man. I'm afraid he's escaped with all the loot and we will never see him again. There's a good chance he'll be caught, Mr. Parker insisted. The police have sent a squad to search for a houseboat where Mary Men and Harmond are still imprisoned. They may be able to surprise Sing Lee there. If the houseboat can be located, Penny added, it has a tricky little habit of vanishing at inconvenient moments. Jerry said it hid out in the narrow river most of the time, venturing on the cobalt only occasionally. But he was kept blindfolded and couldn't definitely identify the stream. I'm sure it was the Snark River, Penny exclaimed. That's where Louise and I saw the boat. Then the police will never find it because they didn't start for the Snark River, Mr. Parker cried. Where's Greg? Well... Well, we'll organize our own searching party. By the time the fire was well under control and any number of men incensed, incensed because of Sing Lee had left the girls in the burning building, were eager to track him down. Mr. Parker and the detective hastily loaded the volunteers into a car. Penny and Louise crowded in beside Mr. Parker to lead the way to the Snark River. Presently abandoning the automobiles, the searching party took it to the woods. Drawing close to the river, Gregory Kane assumed command of the situation, instructing the men to move quietly and to be careful in any use of firearms. There was no sign of the houseboat when they reached the banks of the snark, so the party broke into two groups. Mr. Parker led some of the men upstream, while others walked towards the mouth of the river. Penny and Louise remained with Mudcat Joe and Mr. Parker. They had gone only a short distance when a low-spoken command for silence was given. From far up the stream could be heard the muffled beat of an engine. That may be the houseboat coming, Mr. Parker warned. Spread out men along the banks where the stream is narrow. If I fire a shot, leap a border. Scarcely had the men hidden themselves in the brush when the boat chugged slowly into view. Doggone if it ain't my missing boat, Mudcat Joe muttered. 
Just give me a chance, Adam Chinks. Just give me a chance, them, and I'll get those men. A shot rang out as the houseboat grated softly against the river bank. A dozen men sprang aboard, and those who did not have revolvers had armed themselves with big sticks. Mudcat Joe wielded his club with deadly intent, determined to avenge himself upon the persons who had robbed him of his houseboat. He felt two Chinese men neatly and was sadly disappointed when the others took refuge and pleaded for mercy. Sing Lee alone made an attempt to escape by trying to shoot his way out of the cabin. He was quickly overpowered. The sound of firing brought Gregory Kane, who provided handcuffs for all the robbers. A key taken from Sing Lee opened the padlock inner door of the houseboat, and there, crudely trussed, lay two prisoners, Mr. Merriman and his friend Frank Harmon. They were rushed at once to the hospital, although their condition did not appear to be critical. Gregory Kane took charge of Sen Lee and his henchmen and assumed responsibility for the loot found on the boat. In addition to the jewels stolen from Merriman, Mrs. Faraday's paintings were recovered undamaged, and there likewise was a box of gold coins which had been counted, totaled nearly $10,000. Then no count... Thieves sure banged up River Queen a plenty, Mudcat Joe declared as he inspected his new found property. But I can fix her up again as good as new. I sure am much obliged to you, Miss, for leading me to her. And I'm grateful to you for saving my life, replied Penny. Mr. Parker echoed those words, adding empathetically, You'll certainly hear from me within a few days, Joe. Right now, I must get back to Riverview. This is a big story, and I want to freeze it in type before the time learns what happened up here. May I help, Penny asked. I'm depending upon you to write an account of everything you found in Sing Lee's laundry. Make it thorough, even the dirty shirts. Ignoring the quit, Mr. Parker said tersely, We must step to. Time is precious. Penny's recollection of the fast ride back to Riverview always remained a trifle blurred. Her thoughts centered upon the story she was to write. She mentally blocked out the lead so that she would be ready to dash it off. And a moment she slid into the typewriter chair. They reached the newspaper office where members of the editorial staff were enjoying a brief rest between editions. We're putting out an extra tersely informed Mr. Parker. Hammond and Merriman have been found. The whole case is cleaned up. A banner for the front page, DeWitt, and make it a triple decker across all of the columns. I'll handle the main story myself. Right column with a break on page two. Penny's story will take the left column. Can you handle that much? Easily, she replied. Dig up that flashlight photograph of the portraits in the room seven. We'll run it on page one. We'll also need pictures of Mudcat Joe's houseboat, Old Mansion, and Sing Ling's gang. But they can catch the second edition. The thing now is to get those things to the presses and get the presses rolling. Penny vanished into her father's office and sat down at the typewriter. A story seemed to write itself. Words, sentences, paragraphs flowed from her mind and transferred themselves to the paper. She was only vaguely aware as the city editor, in showing her father a dummy for the front page, peered over her shoulder to read what she had written. Great stuff, he praised. Keep it up. Penny filled five sheets of copy paper and then sat back in her chair satisfied she had done her task well. The presses are all ready to roll, Mr. Parker grinned. Once they start, nothing can stop them. Like an excited schoolboy, he paced the floor and could not relax until the first issue of the paper was placed in his hand. Peering over her father's shoulder, Penny felt a thrill of pride as she saw her own name signed to the story she had just written. It's a beautiful layout. Every bit of it, declared Mr. Parker. You took care of your part like a veteran, Penny. I wish Jerry could see that story, she said wistfully. 
There's no reason why he can't, exclaimed Mr. Parker, taken by the idea. We'll show it to him. As they went out of the building, newsboys were crying the star's latest scoop. The headlines were music to Penny's ears. In the car, driving towards the hospital, she slumped down against her father's shoulder, happy but very tired. Everything turned out beautifully, she sighed. You achieved your scoop. Mudcat Joe recovered his houseboat, and Jerry will get well. Yes, the brakes did come our way, Penny. I suppose Sing Lee will be sent to prison. Undoubtedly, Gus Comstock may have to serve a sentence, too, but his wife should get off lightly. Well, I'm rather glad of that, even if I never liked her. I wondered what will become of Laura. Maybe I can find a job for her but I fear she'll never make a newspaper reporter. No, agreed Penny. The work would kill a stronger person than Laura. As it later developed, there was no need for anyone to worry over the, her future. Laura had made a deep impression upon Mrs. Faraday with the result that when she returned east, she took the girl with her to serve as a secretary and companion. Mr. Parker and Penny arrived at the hospital too late for the usual visiting hours, but they were allowed to see Jerry. The young reporter, still pale and weak, had raised himself to a half-sitting posture. He appeared to be listening intently to some far-off sound and returned his visitor's greeting in perfunctory fashion. Listen, he said, I thought I heard the boys crying an extra. You did, Mr. Parker answered. And here is the copy of it. He spread the edition on the bed. Jerry read eagerly such comments as, Great stuff! What a scoop! Falling from his lips. How do you like Penny's story? Mr. Parker inquired with, when Jerry had finished. It's the tops, Chief. Absolutely the tops. The young reporter turned towards the girl. Penny, let me congratulate you. Just as one reporter to another. So you think I'm a reporter? Penny countered. I think it. I know it. You're a full-fledged news hawk. You mean a hawkling? Penny replied to take some of the edge off the praise. But just the same, she was secretly elated because she knew the young man was not given to flattery. With him, the words of his mouth and the meditation of his heart were identical. And Jerry Livingston had stamped her as a good reporter. That was the best reward of all. The end. Nighty night, Snooky Uckums.